Welcome, everyone. I have a little after seven o'clock, so we will uh, get started. And I hope everyone enjoyed their dinner. I think anyone that's online here, except for Louise, uh, <laughs> uh, and then Austin, who is running our IT tonight. And except for those two, I think everyone probably had dinner uh, this evening, the dinner that we handed out at Coffin Museum or delivered to your home. So we hope you enjoyed your supper. And I wanna thank you all for being a part of this fundraiser. We're so glad you support Coffin Museum and we're grateful uh, that you're joining us this evening. Louise Hansen, who is going to be our speaker tonight, um, it ha is a part of the Can Humanities Kansas Speakers Bureau. Uh, this evening, she is instead using a presentation and adapted specifically for our theme. And our theme is what we're gonna have on exhibit next spring. And that is a celebration of having a museum on the Bethel College campus uh, for 125 years. So 1896 is the magic date when a museum started in the ad building. It was a museum of natural history and ancient relics. And then 1941 became Kaufman Museum, of course. And that's the Kaufman Museum we know now uh, in a little bit different location. So Louise is gonna be talking to us, to us about food traditions in the late 1800s. And she is a retired librarian with a passion for food history. She is sustained in her interest by a collection of over 500 cookbooks uh, in, in her very own collection. And uh, she has given presentations in dozens of communities on food heritage. Uh, she is a longtime resident of Lawrence and we're so glad uh, she's willing to join us tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Louise and we'll go from there now. I believe we decided, Louise, to take questions at the end yep. and not in the chat. Is that correct? Or are we also if, taking if, them in the chat? You can raise your hand and on, that'd be fine. Yeah. Okay, at the end. All yeah. righty. Well, thank you, Louise, and I'll let you take it away. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy, for the invitation to join you tonight. And um, congratulations to the Kaufman Museum on their 125th uh, anniversary. It's a, it's a remarkable event for you. There's every reason for Bethel College, um, Bethel College community to take enormous and well-earned pride in the museum's remarkable history of contributions in fostering enriched museum experiences over many decades. So congratulations to you all. Um, <clears throat> now the, um, title actually of this talk is Tasting the Past, Exploring Kansas Food Memories. With the Homestead Act of 1862 and the expansion of railroad lines, Kansas settlement went from a... Okay, I need to get my screen up right now. The small thing I was going to forget, and that's the slides. Okay, here we go. Uh, with the Homestead Act of 1862 and the expansion of railroad lines, Kansas settlement went from a steady trickle to waves of immigrant groups with distinct ethnic identities. Their national food habits notwithstanding, the earliest European pioneers in Kansas did not routinely consume the foods of their native homelands. They ate what was available, what could be fished, shot, gathered from the wild, or grown in a garden plot. According to one account, pioneer food was often stodgy, plain, or altogether absent. It is heartrending to read of an entire meal consisting of simply cornbread fried in a skillet or just a lone baked sweet potato. The important point is that the early settlers could not replicate the food of their native country, but were obliged to eat what was easily at hand on their Kansas frontier homeland. Rehearsing their national identity through food would come later. During the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, two opposing trends emerged in American eating habits. 
regional and ethnic differences powerfully influenced selection and preparation of food. Where they lived, the Western frontier, the rural South, the East, the Midwest, the Southwest, and where they came from, Greece, Italy, Eastern Europe, Africa, shaped what a family ate. Their style of food preparation was linked to their past and to their ethnic regional histories. The second and competing trend in the United States was a steady move towards standardization as improvements in transportation and preservation helped to create national markets for brand named foods. Foods from one region, re, region could be efficiently transported to others without spoiling, giving rise to what might be considered a more or less distinctive American diet. In this presentation, we will see several examples of how these trends were intertwined over time to change the profiles of our culinary offerings. We're fortunate to have abundant fact-based primary resource material to use for exploring our Kansas food histories. And for this happy state of affairs, we have to thank the thousands of community cookbooks that have been published by religious and community organizations for almost 150 years. Community cookbooks, also called charity cookbooks, are a unique genre of culinary literature. While most of us are familiar with the spiral bound format with a glossy cover, like the Lindsborg cookbook of 1961, community cookbooks appear in many formats. They're hardcover, softcover, mimeograph, paper cover. Some are text only, while others are fully illustrated with original folk art or pen and ink drawings. Many include local photographs, while others opt for the stock photos offered by community cookbook publishers. They are, these cookbooks are produced collaborative, collaboratively by volunteers, usually women, for the single purpose of raising funds in support of the mission of all types of organizations. Almost every kitchen in the state, and indeed in the country, has a batch of these little culinary gems. I myself have a collection of over 500, almost all of which are Kansas products. Kansas State University's Hale Library has a huge special collection of community cookbooks, a food researcher's dream. Since its appearance 147 years ago, Kansas women have continued to produce many hundreds of cookbooks for a myriad of good causes. Emphasizing the fundraiser raiser motivation for community cookbooks, a pithy advertisement from a publisher in a 1972 volume encourages organizations to compile a cookbook of their own for fun and profit if they need dough, K-N-E-A-D, need dough. The very first Kansas Community Cookbook was published in 1874. The Kansas Home Cookbook, consisting of recipes contributed by ladies of Leavenworth and other cities and towns in support of the Kansas Home for the Friendless. For a number of years, this Leavenworth institution served women in dire need of its support. Of course, the year 1874 Resonates, resonates with the Mennonite audience, since it is the year of the great migration from Russia of Mennonites to the barren South Central Kansas Plains. While Mennonites were coping with drought conditions, a grasshopper invasion on a biblical scale, and the trials of establishing homesteads in a strange new land, Leavenworth folks, by contrast, we were already well established. Leavenworth, the very first incorporated city in the Kansas Territory, had been founded 20 years earlier in 1854. As a manufacturing hub, the community was enjoying a robust prosperity that is, that is reflected in its cookbook. The Kansas Home Cookbook is remarkable, providing as it does a profile of the culinary and social life of the day. 
One portion of the cookbook features a number of menus or bills of fare as they were known at the time. What the Leavenworth ladies suggest as plain dinners were meals with a starter course, followed by an entree with side dishes and one or more desserts. Um, what the let, um, let's see where I'm So we, we can see here that this, this particular um, uh, lineup of plain dinners is not unlike a dinner that we might have today um, uh, on Sunday. And so this is, and this is what they uh, called a plain dinner. And you can see here that your variety of vegetables, most of them are familiar to us um, and desserts. Uh, and, and of course, um, you see a lot of um, emphasis on pies and Kansas uh, is known as a pie loving state. In contrast to the plain dinners, uh, which you see here, uh, they also had um, a lineup of company dinners, uh, 1874 company dinners that are, 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 are quite elaborate, a groaning board of offerings in four courses. This particular one is noteworthy for a variety of reasons. The first course is oyster soup. A whole section in this cookbook features oysters. Oyster sauce, oyster patties, escalloped oysters, oysters in a pie, stewed oysters. Landlocked Kansas in the 19th and 20th century was awash in oysters. At this time, the Chesapeake Bay waters of the East Coast teemed with cheap oysters. And so the enterprising fishermen shipped hundreds of thousands of barrels of them and railroad cars to the Midwest for broad distribution. The KU historian Lynn Nelson writes of the frolicking community socials staged in small Kansas towns all over the state, where the centerpiece of the event was a steaming cauldron of steamed oysters. These cast iron cauldrons can still be found in the center of some towns, now filled with flowers in the town square. For decades now, nary an oyster recipe appears in a Kansas cookbook, except for a few that might find their way into turkey dressing at Thanksgiving. As desirable as eating locally sourced foods may be, Kansans have been avid importers of foods for a very long time. The potato side dish we see here on this menu may be predictable, but to call them Irish potatoes, you see that Irish potatoes, was a misnomer. The waxy spuds called Irish potatoes are not native to Ireland, but are actually are, are, are from the Andes Mountains region of South America. The Irish imported that strain of potato. Later, they came to be called Irish potatoes in association with the Irish potato famine. Lastly, let's puzzle over one of the desserts that may be unfamiliar to us, hedgehog pudding. Um, at the time this um, uh, cookbook was written in 1874, Leavenworth host hostesses were actually serving an old fashioned dessert when they dished up hedgehog pudding. It had, was popular in the late, 18th century, colonial, col the late 18th century colonial period, for, perhaps because it was loaded with alcohol. Probably not a favorite of the temperance movement people, the recipe calls for a cup of wine and a glass of brandy, in addition to milk, egg, sugar, and sponge cake. The hedgehog design is made by sticking slices of almonds into the body of the pudding. Hedgehog pudding has largely passed off the culinary scene. 
it's natural that reviewing these suggested party breakfast menus would meet with an alarming response. After all, the three um, men, uh, three uh, breakfast menus shown here have six courses each. Now, just take a look at some of the, the foods that are offered in these courses. Now, mind you, these are not everyday breakfast courses. These are uh, bre breakfast, everyday breakfast. They are party, considered party breakfast, where you would entertain guests. But they are very fulsome. You've got quail, lamb, more oysters. Told you, more, more oysters. Um, prairie chickens. Um, trout, filet of beef, um, sardines. Uh, this is breakfast fare um, for a party. Of course, quail, oysters, trout, and porterhouse steaks for breakfast would be anything, wouldn't be very unusual um, uh, fare in Kansas generally. It's more telling of a town in the throes of prosperity with hostesses that were very willing to flaunt it. One of the telltale signs that a cookbook is vintage is the sizable attention to bread making. In this Leavenworth cookbook, we find 33 recipes for bread and nine for making yeast. Bread making was a core component in cookbooks for decades, but died out quite suddenly and almost completely with the invention of a bread slicing machine and the introduction of store-bought sliced bread in the late 1920s. Contemporary community cookbooks contain bread recipes that contain bread re recipes are very rare. There are, there are important differences between vintage cookbooks and contemporary ones other than recipes and cooking techniques. Vintage cookbooks typically lists the recipe and contributors using their marriage names. That is to say their husband's names rather than their own given names, unless the women were single. Thus an 1899 cookbook from Fredonia lists the recipes, a recipe for mutton dressed like, uh, mutton dressed like venison from a Mrs. B. R. Way and a sunshine cake from the probably unmarried Alice Allen. Over the decades, one can observe a gradual shift toward listing the given names for a married contributor. So this, you can see the, the, um, uh, how, how the place of women uh, recorded in cookbooks without ever talking about how, how women's situations had changed. But if you look at the cookbooks, you can actually see this slowly um, evolving situation. The whole, um, uh, the standard of, of um, having cooks list their given names was quite thoroughly settled by the 1970s when almost all recipe authors listed their given names. Another major evolution in cookbooks over time is the shift away from writing a recipe as just straight text without a separate list of ingredients. Mrs. McDonald Moore's rather exotic recipe for tongue de terrapin is the typical format. It's just, uh, it's just simply text. It's a strange title for a dish, not made of turtle tongue, but rather beef tongue. I never, I, I chose this because it's so odd. Uh, but anyway, there are just many, many, many examples of straight text, no ingredients first, which would come later. It's a strange, to, uh, over the decades, listing ingredients first, followed by the instructions for preparation became more common and eventually universal practice. Incidentally, you'll note at the bottom of this recipe here, here at the this last line, uh, a, a little ad line, an advertisement on, on the bottom of the page that reads dainty toilets, Virat's perfumes, toilet waters, sachets. 
Now, such ads were commonly scattered on the pages of vintage cookbooks. And it's kind of a problem, you know, the, the, the little the phrase for, for dainty toilets. I don't know, somehow it doesn't do a lot for the um, encouragement of an appetizing uh, recipe. In addition to not providing a separate ingredients list, measurement amounts of ingredients were sometimes vague, sometimes not specific or even omitted entirely. One unexpected comment about inexact measurement came from a gentleman in a Dodge City audience I spoke to. He shared with the group that his mother measured the dough for the top hat bun of Swebach by pinching off dough the size of Aunt B's goiter. Obviously, this measurement technique could not easily be duplicated for general use. In the 19th and early 20th century, it was common for community cookbooks to include many medicinal cures for humans and also animals. Whole sections of early cookbooks routinely featured recipes to treat a huge array of illnesses. Tip typical of these is the 1920 cookbook from Perry, Kansas, with recipes for poultices, laxatives, and cures for croup. Ingredients suggested for the making of cough medicine includes muriate of ammonia, chloroform, sugar, and water. Perhaps the idea here was that if you can't cure the cough, you can at least render the patient totally unconscious. Clearly the abundance and variety of medicinal recipes attest to the role of women in the home as nurse and caregiver, as well as cook, sometimes in desperate circumstances. With just a little bit of imagination, we can read a recipe and paint a mental picture of the story it tells. A 1902 recipe is entitled simply, Internal Cancer Cure. It reads, take the dried blossoms of the common red clover, put them in hot water, let them steep overnight, and this will be a clover tea. Take a tablespoon of this tea five or six times daily. Cases of virulent cancer have been cured by this simple recipe. Because this is a commemorative 125th anniversary event, I want to continue this exploration of Kansas food memories by looking back at what Kansans of the 1890s were eating about the time of the Kaufman Museum's founding. All of the components of your anniversary dinner would have appeared in one version or another on Kansas tables at the time. But these were certainly not the only choices the planners of your menu had available to them. I don't know what type of vegetable soup was served for tonight's supper, but some version of borscht would have been appropriate. Mennonites certainly loved their borscht. The Eden Mennonite Church in Mound Ridge included three borscht recipes in their 1995 community cookbook. There would have been several types of borscht with Mennonite associations from which to choose. Possibly the clear based uh, borscht that you see here or the classic Ukrainian red beet or even the somewhat rarer suma borscht made with early summer garden vegetables. Favored as a garnish for borscht was smetna, that is sour cream, although some might have preferred radish, cucumber, or sprigs of dill. Tracing the lineage of borscht takes us back to Ukraine before the ninth century AD, when a simple broth was brewed from herbs like cow parsnip or hogweed that had been fermented. That doesn't, those herbs don't sound very appetizing uh, to us. Cow parsnip and hogweed. Here, but here lies the distinctive feature of all borscht. It is sour. 
This brings us to no matter how different one borscht is from another, if it's sour, it's borscht. And this brings us to a point made earlier about the dual trends of embracing traditional food while at the same time absorbing national brand names, nam named products into our food repertoire. It is not uncommon for Mennonite borscht recipes to use canned tomato soup as a broth base. The Swiss Mennonites here in North Newton have a modernized borscht recipe made with canned beets and canned pork and beans, <clears throat> while maintaining that all important tanginess with the addition of a dash of vinegar. It might be tempting for someone to suggest that these are borscht recipes that are less than authentic. There is probably no more fraught term in culinary discourse than the word authentic. Certainly one can imagine or even know and even know of family members strained because the dame, daughter made her sweeback with butter instead of the authentic way with lard as her grandmother made it. In the case of borscht, the Mennonite or Jewish or Polish borscht are certainly not the original borscht of fermented herb broth. And yet any cook from these traditions might claim his or her borscht as authentic, as if the real, the true borscht is one specific version of the dish, which it is not. It's probably best to focus on how good the version of the food you are offering tastes rather than its pedigree. Years ago, my Swedish mother-in-law served what was claimed to be a very authentic, if notorious, lutefisk on Christmas Eve. But I assure you, the authentic lutefisk tasted just awful. Besides roast chicken, an alternative entree might have been considered by the museum meal planners for this evening's supper. If I had a vote, I would have selected scrapple as your entree. While the dish is associated most closely with Pennsylvania Germans or Pennsylvania Dutch, Mennonites also have deep ties to scrapple as confirmed from numerous Mennonite cookbooks. One of the earliest immigrant groups to arrive in territorial Kansas, the Pennsylvania Dutch brought scrapple with them, traditionally a mush of pork scraps and trimmings combined with cornmeal and wheat or buckwheat flour and spices. A Eureka, Kansas recipe from the year of Kaufman Museum's 1896 founding is typical. Scrape and clean well a pig's head as directed in pig's head cheese. Put on to boil in plenty of water. Cook four or five hours until the bones will slip readily from the meat. Take out, remove the meat, skim off the grease from the liquor in the pot and return the chopped meat to it. Season highly with salt and pepper and a little powdered sage if you like and add cornmeal till of the consistency of soft mush. Cook slowly one hour or more and pour in pans and set to cool. This is nice sliced and fried for breakfast in winter and will answer in the place of meat on many occasions. Scrapple is still quite popular today, but despite the fact that it is a trip down memory lane for many Pennsylvania Dutch and Mennonites, it no longer is made in the home for very obvious reasons. It can, however, sometimes be found in supermarkets under a number of different commercial names. I trust Bethel College folks will plan to enjoy this treat as you celebrate National Scrapple Day on November the 8th. There might have been others, other, um, Others on the menu committee who held scrapple in disdain and campaigned instead for the various other 1890s main dish choices. Baked liver would garner, garner at least a few votes, maybe. 
but more popular bets might be tried and true beer rocks. After all, beer rocks recipes are found in virtually every cookbook compiled by German Russians. Made of somewhat sweet dough, wrapped around a filling of cabbage, onions, and meat, usually beef, and then baked, beer rocks are really not a German food, but rather a Russian one. And a clue to this is that the word beer rock evolved from the Russian word pirogi, a piroshki. In the end, your menu committee settled on roast chicken for the, for the dinner entree. A tried and true choice, what's there not to like? The 1890s salad scene in Kansas was not very robust. I have never seen a salad as refined as your salad course of peppery frise in any cookbook of that period. Salads commonly in those days might be some version of a Waldorf salad made with walnuts, apples, and celery, and to bind, and to bind it all together as one cook advised, any nice salad dressing. Other popular salads of the day were pea, fruit, bean, and very commonly coleslaw. Note that the much beloved American innovation, the gelatin or congealed salads as they were called, were nowhere to be found in the 1890s. Then in 1904, a Mr. Charles Knox promoted his gelatin at the World's Fair and sales of jello began to soar. Perfection salad, an aspic filled with chopped cabbage, celery, and red pepper, graced many tables in the early 1900s and spawned a huge repertoire of jello salad variations, still popular and enjoyed today. As for desserts, your menu committee made a spot on choice with apple charlotte. By 1896, it had been around for almost 100 years. This was created by the French chef, Marie Turin. Basically, it's a tart that uses day-old dried sliced bread with a homemade spiced apple filling, sometimes drizzled with a citrus or apricot sauce or topped with whipped cream. Desserts abound in Kansas cookbooks generally, but in terms of sheer numbers, your neighbors to the north of, uh, of Swedish heritage take the cake, so to speak. In some of these community cookbooks, more than half of all the recipes included are desserts and sweets of every description. To conclude my riff on your commemorative menu, I'll bring your attention to a dessert choice that might have been an alternative to Apple Charlotte the ever-beloved vinegar pie. We rarely see recipes for vinegar pie today, although they were very common in older Kansas cookbooks. And some uh, of those cookbooks include multiple recipes for vinegar pie. We still use a lot of vinegar in recipes, but we generally don't make pie out of it. And that is because we have apples available to us all year long. In the past, apples were plentiful only in the autumn. When a long winter set in, dried apples would be used in place of fresh ones to make pie. But as early spring approached, even the cache of dried apples was depleted and cooks were left with only their ingenuity to guide them. They turned to apple cider vinegar as a reasonable apple substitute. Ingredients typically include sugar, flour, butter, vinegar, lemon, and nutmeg poured into a rich pastry crust. The consistency is some, somewhat like a lemon pie, perhaps a little denser. I advise you to give this old favorite a try in your kitchens. As the Jewish housewife says, try it, you'll like it. Now, I, I just want to draw your attention to something about this kind of interesting about this particular recipe, which you can't see too well, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly read it. You, you line a, a pie mold with a rich paste and fill it with one small cup of sugar, tablespoon of flour, butter the size of a walnut, 
Um, one half tea, uh, teacup each of sour vinegar and water. Mix well and flavor with lemon or nutmeg. Now that's the end of the recipe. They don't, first of all, they advise, it, it, it suggests that you're actually mi mixing those ingredients inside the pie shell, which you would not be doing. You would have it in a bowl and then you would put it into the pie shell. So that, that's odd. The other thing is it has no, um, there is no indication of what um, uh, oven uh, temperature it's baked in. So um, you, there's a lot to be desired in this recipe. It's very incomplete. And actually, you, it's very, very common to see recipes that um, are incomplete or have um, dr dramatically problematic mistakes in them so that they will sometimes say something like, instead of adding a teaspoon of vanilla, you add a cup of vanilla or you know, something of that kind. That's, that's very, very common and, and, and very amusing when you come, come across them. Most of us have heard the um, old adage, we are what we eat. Some people, I think that this refers to the association of eating bad food with conse uh, and consequently having bad health. Or it might mean that eating bad food, for example, rich food, makes you morally bad. Think about recipes that are titled, for example, decadent chocolate cake or sinful cookies. What is being suggested is that eating sugary, buttery desserts might indicate that you are a morally deficient person. But this is not the meaning we have adopted here. What I mean by we are what we eat has to do with the vital role food plays in shaping our identity of who we are as people, not only as individuals, but also as groups. Food is a cultural experience and as such plays an elemental role in connecting us to our cultural heritage. As the late writer and television personality, Anthony Bourdain expressed it, food is everything we are. It's an extension of nationalist feeling, ethnic feeling, your personal history, your province, your region, your tribe, your grandma. It's inseparable from those from the get-go. Hopefully my comments have caused us to think about how food traditions have made us everything we are. The sociologist Max Weber has written, human beings, humans are beings suspended in webs of significance that they themselves have spun. The foods of Kansans are such webs of significance, telling us over and over again, this is who we are. This is how we know who we are. We can taste it. And thank you very much, Bethel people. And again, congratulations on your anniversary celebration. Thank you so much, Louise. This is Andy speaking. And we really appreciate, Can why don't you nod, Louise, if you can hear me? I can, Andy. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That's very intriguing. And we've already started out with a comment in the chat box. Uh, Mary Ann said, old fashioned vinegar pie is in the melting pot of Mennonite cookery. And that's something we sell in our store here at Coffin Museum. We have a little gift shop and we do sell it here. I have one at home. So uh, page 293, thanks for that hint, Mary Ann. Um, I might need to try that. Absolutely. Any other questions? We have, uh, I don't see the long list, but I'll flip through some of the names here. They could bring up their videos, right, right, um, Andy? Uh, so Austin, is there a way to put everybody's faces on the screen or is that? Um, yeah, they will have to turn their video on, but everyone should have the ability to unmute themselves and uh, have their video on. Okay, so if anyone wants to ask a question, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I'll throw one out while people are finding their mute buttons. 
And uh, my question is on a couple of those 1874 menus, I saw one said boiled macaroni, another one said uh, macaroni. And I wondered, uh, was it common to have dried like elbow macaronis in the 1870s? Mm -hmm. And where did that come from? I mean, I mean, like, did they literally make that at home or did they yeah. purchase it and bring it? Yeah, it, generally it would have been dried. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not unlike what we, you can buy in the grocery store today. However, the one thing that they would do when they boiled it is they would boil it to death. I mean, ah. they, would, they would boil it until you could really throw it at the wall and it would stick there. Um, uh, you, you see recipes for macaroni um, that they ask you to boil it for as much as 20 minutes. Ooh. Yeah, so so it's <laughs> it's quite it's quite a it's quite a scary uh, situation with with macaroni, but it it would have been dried. They would not have been making it fresh. So you'd buy it at the general store in town. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, prob probably in bulk. They have probably had bulk barrels of it. <laughs> Any other questions from the crowd? Hi, this is Marianne. Can you hear me? Yep, oh, we can. Um, on the pages with the vinegar pie in our melting pot cookbook, there's also a pie, cottage cheese pie, which I make every year for my uh, sister's birthday. That's her favorite pie. Is that <laughs> something you've seen in other cookbooks? I have not seen, seen it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, now, uh, when you make it, Marianne, do you, do you drain off the the um, the whey part of the um, cottage cheese? That would be the liquid part. Yes, it, the recipe calls for dried cottage cheese, but I okay. didn't have any, so I yes, I drain just regular store bought right. and cottage cheese for it. That, that's it's basically the only a, a basically a lumpy um, <laughs> um, custard pie. Yeah. <laughs> It's probably very good. The only the only one issue I could see possibly with it, if it was too too liquidy, it could be. A uh -huh. Yeah, for myself, I usually I don't know if the recipe call. Yeah, the recipe calls for sprinkling with cinnamon, and when mm -hmm. I do custard pie, I always do um, nutmeg instead. But of course, that's just whatever flavor you add. Sounds good. Well, I, I have another question. Uh, so what form, all those oysters people were eating, what form did that come in? I mean, packed on ice, canned. Yeah. Uh, I don't know much about oysters at all, so I don't know how you preserve well, it's, them. It's or... an alarming thing because especially when we think of local foods, um, to know that in the, 18, in, in the uh, 19th century, um, there was a huge amount of, of shellfish from the East Coast. And they would pack them into barrels and wrap um, those barrels with um, ice and cover them in burlap. And it would, it would stay a day or two. And of course, once they were uh, arrived, uh, they would be eaten pretty quickly. Mm. Um, they were they're exceedingly popular. So. Um, and, and just you, you'd have a, a small cookbook of, say, maybe 100, 100 recipes or so, not, not that many. And you might have 15 oyster recipes in it. That's how popular they were. Mm -hmm. I, I've had some people say that they um, put oysters in Thanksgiving stuffing and that the, their kids don't like it. And so um, uh, they are... Um, one little boy said, "My mother makes me make um, makes me eat canned tomato soup instead because he, he refuses to eat the Thanksgiving um, the Thanksgiving dressing with with oysters in it." I have heard of a, a number of families here in the Newton area that have oyster soup on New Year's Eve. Uh huh. It's very common. My, my family doesn't, but I know some others that do. It, it's very common on New Year's Eve. Yeah. In fact, the uh, those frolicking socials used to be one of the ways that teenage um, uh, 
girls and guys would meet each other over the over the oyster <laughs> soup pot. So it was a, it was they looked forward to it because it was a it was a a um, venue for having a good time and and flirting and so on. So mm -hmm. has a maybe it's responsible for many a Kansas marriage. <laughs> over, over, over the oyster pot and then meeting over the oyster pot. Are you still collecting cookbooks? I am. I, I'm more selective because I have so many. Mm -hmm. I have an office filled, filled with them, but I'm more selective. I, I try to find where I have a hole, uh, don't have um, some that I would like to have, like um, Oh, there are some Jewish cookbooks from a certain period I'd like to have. I don't have very many. <clears throat> and um, so I'll, I'll go be on the lookout for mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. um, you can get them online. I, I search and um, eBay has Kansas cookbooks. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll look at, over those and see if there's where I can fill some holes. But as I mentioned, you know, if for I mean, this, this Hale Library collection at K-State is just amazing. It's just wonderful. I was, I was very worried when uh, that library suffered that terrible fire you know, several years ago, but mm -hmm. they're back. They're back and doing their thing now. So it's, I'm very gratified about that. And is that library open to the public or is it, is it only a research library? You can't no, check things out or can you check things out? Well, you wouldn't, um, you might be able to use a Kansas library card to the Kansas State Library to check something out, but you might have to go through a certain bureaucratic thing to, mm -hmm. to do that. But um, uh, anybody interested in, in food studies in Kansas, that, that's just a remarkable, uh, gold mine of material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, either your own food stories or questions for Louise? Uh, this is Bonnie Crable, and I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, in a lot of recent or maybe 10, 15 year old church cookbooks, a lot of them have a lot of like canned soup, canned this. Some recipes have as many as three or four cans put together in a casserole of some kind. When did that, using a lot of like canned soups and that kind of thing, when did those appear? Well, you know, um, this is what I, I've talked about, these dual trends, try, you, uh, keeping your traditional cook, cooking uh, techniques and and ingredients and dishes going at the same time, these um, uh, prepared foods were coming on the scene. And they, in some cases, they have just, they have taken over. And one of the areas that you can see it very, very markedly is in the jello salads, especially the jello salads of the 1950s and 60s. And there you might have a jello salad that has say, um, uh, say 10 ingredients in it and six or seven of them would or or more actually would be um uh, uh brand name products like marshmallows or standard products uh like uh, marshmallows sweetened coconut uh sweetened pineapple uh added to the sweetened jello itself. Uh, and so it's just a huge, and, and, then, and then additions like Cool Whip is very common. And uh, so you're just augmenting um, the, the glycemic index of those foods. Um, and and, and th this uh, sometimes is a very, uh, a, a very alarming in the number of sugared ingredients that are going into that into that um, food. But the beginnings of bringing in standard foods, I mean, it, it's an 18th century phenomenon. Well, there were um, where you have um, baking powder is, is nationally produced, flour in some cases is, 
and um, these uh, foods are distributed. Uh, biscuits of various kinds, crackers. Um, they, uh, that's a 19th century, it was getting going. And of course, all through the 20th century, it just, it, um, uh, just expanded uh, hugely so that we have, you know, literally thousands of prepared foods, which we try to amalgam, you know, may bring into our uh, traditional cuisines. So, um, there's, um, gee, I can't remember the, the Mennonite, or maybe it's a Volga German, um, recipe that is advertised or, or, or it's noted that it is authentic and yet it's made with um, imperial oleomargarine and um, uh, boxed potato flakes. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, traditional food with the addition of standardized uh, um, uh, prepared foods, very, but, but it goes back to the 19th century, started in the 19th century. So a, qu a question related to that, when does a jello cross from being a salad to a dessert? Does it depend it, on the quantity of Cool Whip or? Uh, I think where, where you actually choose, what section of the cookbook you choose to put your dish in. Um, there is such a thing as a, a, a Jello Snickers um, salad, salad, and I, <laughs> and that was found in the salad section of the cookbook, and it clearly should have been in the dessert section. But you're right. I mean, what what is the from a the standpoint of the nutritional breakdown of what's in there? Um, it could just, it just as easily be a dessert. My mother-in-law makes the Snickers salad with all the Cool Whip and Snickers and everything. And it comes from Kelowna, Iowa is where she got hers from. That's where she's from. But, but does, does she serve it as a dessert? Yeah, we eat it all, all through the meal, through, through the <laughs> dessert too. Oh, oh, okay, okay, that, that's interesting. On the table, it's just special okay. occasions where the family gets together. Okay. And it always had to be with a... I can't remember if it was baby pearl, tapioca. Uh -huh. It was one certain size that we'd have to go to the Amish store to get, but I okay. don't remember which size it was, but it had to be a certain size. <laughs> now, now it is true that uh, though, that even very vintage salads often had a lot of sugar in their salad dressings, like a half a cup or, you know, a lot. Uh, 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 but but it, but really, um, the over the top uh, sugar uh, allotment belongs to the to the Jello Jello salad domain. All right. Any other questions for Louise? Um, I worked at the Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College in the mid 70s, and we got the budget, the Amish um, news newsletter, newspaper, whatever. I think I can't remember if it was out of Ohio or wherever. And I was always amazed at how many things, like with tacos and stuff, that the Amish had. <laughs> tacos. Yes, you uh -huh. know something something with Mexican things, and it was more Eastern. It wasn't, you know, like down here. When did you know, like um, Mexican dishes, kind of start appearing more in in um, you know community cookbooks? Oh, pretty early. Um, they're they're not the um, Mexican American. Um, uh, that's an interesting story, how Mexican-American food uh, uh, took over the restaurant scene. In, in Lawrence here now, we have like seven or eight um, Mexican-American restaurants, and, and there are more, more. There's another one going uh, up on Massachusetts Street right now, a new one. Um, but they, they are, are at, they've been around actually in, for a very long time, but particularly in Texas and New Mexico. Um, there were, they would, um, there were even women who sold tacos on the street of St. Uh, Augustine, um, uh, 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 Texas, 
who were called taco queens. And they, they would um, sell their wares to um, uh, work, working people uh, for lunch. And it was, and it was very popular. And this is the 19th century. But it, it spread north and it spread out. And now it's ubiquitous, of course, um, the uh, Mexican-American fair. The, the taco queens were eventually um, disallowed from selling street food because it was considered unsanitary. But the real reason was because it was uh, competed with the other restaurants in town and they mm. didn't want those women selling their, their wares. They didn't want the competition. We are creeping up on uh, eight o'clock here. So I think we will thank Louise so much for your time this evening. And uh, this program will be online uh, on the oh, museum. That must be a fake background. Oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> I do have a fake background. Um, but this will be on, um, on YouTube uh, sometime later on sometime later on uh, Monday. So you can look forward to seeing that. And if you uh, talk to friends who I know were also attending the dinner who maybe didn't get attend now, please feel free to uh, share that information. And we will send out the link to that YouTube program uh, to everyone that had reservations. So thank you, Louise. If you know how, you, you we can all give her a round of applause on our little reactions there. Thank you very much. And thank you, Andy, for the invitation and to Austin for his um, uh, generous uh, help with the uh, IT issues. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for supporting Kaufman Museum by attending the dinner tonight at your own tables. <laughs> all righty. Thank you so much, Louise.